come with me. I want to take you back to one of the most difficult moments of my life. It was March of 2012. I was sitting at my computer screen and I was staring at a letter. I spent a long time struggling to write. And as hard as it was to write it, it was even harder to find the courage to press send. That's because this wasn't an ordinary letter. This letter contained a secret, one I spent my whole life trying to protect, trying to keep hidden. And I knew that once it was out there, my whole life, my whole world was likely to change. So I agonized over this letter. I read it over and over, and then one night I just gathered up all my courage and I hit send. Whew. Right? I'm supposed to tell you my secret was out there. I felt this overwhelming wave of relief. But I didn't. I was terrified, and rightfully so. You see, I knew this secret would change the way people saw me, and I thought I was ready for their judgment, but nothing. Nothing can prepare you for an overwhelming tsunami of hate. Senseless, blind, crude as it may be, still absolutely devastating. Still, it's one of the best decisions I ever made, and I'm going to tell you why. Let me give you some context. First, I'm Egyptian. I'm a proud Egyptian. I'll always be a proud Egyptian, even if the Egypt that I grew up in became increasingly rigid as I aged. Politically, socially, religiously, the powers that be created an environment that choked the freedoms of millions of people. Anyone who didn't fit into the normal narrative that they set for us, anyone who dared challenge those in power, certainly. But not me. I mean, I was safe. My grandparents were famous celebrities, literally revered in Egypt. And as their grandson, I inherited this admiration. In fact, I was often referred to as Egypt's favorite son. You know, growing up a Sharif in Egypt, that's kind of like being born a Kennedy. Or, well, look at me, more of a Kardashian, maybe. I don't, I don't know. The point is, I had every opportunity in my life. I got to be an actor from a young age a spokesperson for top brands, even an underwear model. I've since rediscovered carbohydrates. My mom says I look healthy. I think, I think my shadow looks fat. <laughs> But the point is, if I wasn't overly exposed, I was certainly visible. But I was also forced to be invisible. You know, being in the public eye, people thought they knew me, but they didn't really know because I couldn't let them see yes. I'm Egyptian. Yes, I come from this famous family, but like I said, I have a secret. I'm gay. This was something about me that I kept hidden because it was something that didn't fit into the Egypt that I knew, the Egypt that scoffed at human rights and persecuted people who were different. You know, being homosexual isn't technically illegal in Egypt, but it does mean living in near constant fear. The LGBT community is often arrested and charged with crimes such as obscenity, prostitution, inciting debauchery, and so forth. As a teenager, I remember seeing coverage of the Cairo 52, when a disco called the Queen Boat was raided on the Nile. The police raided it, 52 men were arrested, charged, tried, tortured, and eventually convicted of these crimes. Even the men that were ultimately acquitted had their names dragged through the media, their reputations destroyed, they were forced to undergo invasive medical examinations that are tantamount to torture, according to Amnesty International. They were rejected by their families and by society. I always worried that that would be my story one day, that I might get caught that same way. I heard stories like that for years, and you continue to hear them to this day. If you look here, This is a still image from a news report just three years ago. The journalist, I'm not going to give her credit, and I'm not going to name her, she orchestrated a raid of a bathhouse along with the police. They charged in, handcuffed all these men, marched them out naked while filming them, and accused them of homosexuality and spreading AIDS in Egypt. That was the headline story on the nightly news. The story? Completely fabricated. None of these men were even gay but the hate that drove it, and the fear and shame that it instilled. That's very real. You see more, even more recent images. Look at these gay men being dragged into jails. 
See how they cover their faces with their shirts or their hands, hiding their shame, and leaving observers to imagine that these men could be anyone. Deviants could be anywhere. They could be anyone, anyone except brothers, sons, grandsons, or friends. You see, when a community is forced to live in the shadows. We are literally the perfect faceless victims. So you can imagine, as a gay man, I felt lonely and isolated, and like I didn't have a place in my own country. And it's going to sound trivial to you, but maybe the only source of solace that I felt came from Hollywood films and TV shows, shows like Will and Grace. <laughs> Seeing scenes like these of people living openly and authentically and happily being embraced by those around them, they provided me with great comfort. They helped me realize that I wasn't alone. That different isn't bad, and that there was a community out there, even if it was thousands of miles away in Hollywood, that loved and supported and embraced the invisible me. In 2012, I saw a glimmer of hope. As many of you know, this was a time of great change for our country. We were in the midst of a political revolution. Behind us were the jubilant celebrations in Tahrir Square, but ahead of us lay uncertainty. There was hopes that things would change. There were promises of more open and tolerant society to come, but really, it was anyone's guess what life would be like in the wake of a revolution. It was a formative and fragile time for our country, but at that moment, I knew it was the time I had to add my voice to those calling for an open and inclusive Egypt. I was a public figure, so I was given a voice. But with a voice comes a responsibility to use it. So I came out. I wrote the letter. I revealed my secret. I used myself as a litmus test. I challenged those in power to react with the eyes of the world watching. I demanded that equal rights be given to all citizens, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or what have you. You know, I knew full well from getting my master's degree in politics that when entrenching constitutional principles, if a group is excluded from the outset, it could take centuries before the issue is revisited. The piece immediately went viral. It went global. It was trending, number two on Yahoo, number three on Twitter, and I was being inundated with hateful messages from all sides. They ran the gamut from snide comments to death threats, and it was impossible to know which threats were real, which were credible. But they were so constant and so extreme that one thing became immediately clear. Be a while, if ever, that I would get to go home. And I still haven't been home. Not even to attend my grandparents' funerals. From Egypt's favorite son, I was reduced to public enemy number one, a de facto refugee. I fell into depression. I had suicidal thoughts, but. Probably the worst is that I nearly convinced myself that I shouldn't have hit send. But then something wonderful happened. Maybe I'd missed them in the avalanche of hate, or maybe they came later. But soon I started to see messages like these. They trickled in slowly, and there weren't many at first, but. Their impact on me was huge. They convinced me that I had made the right choice, and they put something into focus that has been at the heart of everything I've done since. That maybe just the way as I took comfort in TV shows and characters that I could relate to, maybe my story could help feel others less alone. Emboldened, I became the national spokesperson of the world's largest LGBT media advocacy organization, where I honed my skills and my messages as I put, prepared to push for equality back home in the Middle East. No small task, and finally, three years later, I felt ready to confront my demons, and I conducted my first Arabic language TV interview, live, in person, 40 minutes, as an open, and visible, and proud gay man. It was a show with millions of viewers, four million tuned in live. Some 20 million people watched it. After the host is essentially the male Barbara Walters of the Middle East, <laughs> very handsome.、Um, but what was important about the interview is、uh, 
the fact that it was going to be the first time that many people in the region had actually heard directly from an LGBT person, speaking openly and authentically, appealing to their hearts and minds as someone they watched grow up from a young age. I gave them a face, someone they could recognize. Again, I was scared. I was inviting a reaction, and so I prepared myself for another onslaught of hate. And to be sure, it came. But this time, it was diluted with an unexpectedly strong wave of support. Even more messages like before, messages like these. <laughs> a lot has changed in the world since then. <laughs> in some places, life has improved for LGBT people. But in Egypt, the situation has regressed. Today, amidst the new and particularly brutal crackdown against the community, the pendulum has really swung back to government-mandated discrimination and intolerance. Today's an election in Egypt, foregone conclusion. But no matter what, nothing will change for the LGBT community. As many societies, rightfully frustrated by a slow and painful pace of progress, have discovered. The LGBT community makes the perfect scapegoat. Deviants, debauched radicals, whose only real crime is believing that we should be free to live in the same relative quiet that we have for generations, free from the terror the slightest gesture or glance might betray us. I try to offer LGBT Egyptians a form of hope that I can believe in, that the entire history of human progress is a continual journey towards inclusivity, that once people have had their first taste of community, of love, of a chance to live their authentic identities, of freedom, that there is no dam that will ever hold that back. The tide of tolerance is inevitable. But Egypt, like every nation, has to decide how many lives will be lost and broken before they acknowledge that we are not faceless men, but we are brothers and sisters and fellow citizens. They have to meet more of us. So although, once again, today, in Egypt, silence feels like the safest option, it cannot be the only option. I've come to learn that while my story alone may not change the course of a country, it can play a small part in challenging and inspiring others to live openly and authentically. And if my story can inspire others, their story can inspire others. Stories hold incredible power, and this power is no longer in the hands of a few. It's no longer in the hands of a centralized source. We have a connected world. And with the power of new media, this power has been dispersed to all of us to share our stories. To create change and to accelerate acceptance. My story is just one out of many, many millions. But that doesn't make it small. That's what makes it huge. We're not alone, and together, with our stories, we could inspire millions more. So I ask you, join me. Come with me. Come with all of those who spoke today, and change the world. Thank you.